The weekend had a lot to talk about, and we're going to talk about it all here on today's episode of Locked on Pirates. You are Locked on Pirates, your daily Pittsburgh Pirates podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And of course, welcome back to the Locked on Pirates podcast here on the Locked on Podcast podcast network where it is your team your pittsburgh pirates every single day my name is ethan smith you can follow me right there on twitter at mvp underscore ethan or at locked on pirates or at steel city pirates even though i don't run that uh, twitter account you can still follow that twitter account to find all of my work on the pittsburgh pirates and find all of your news analysis opinions and reactions that you can find here on the locked on podcast network Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Make sure you download the app today and use code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. And if you want to find some more good content over at Steel City Pirates and, of course, on the Pirates Fan Forum every Thursday that had Chad Hermanson on the show last week, make sure you go check out Gary Morgan. Gary, it almost feels like we had like a bachelor party weekend, and now it's like you're back to work on Monday, and you're just like, "What in the hell happened?" <laughs> Yeah, it was funny. It was it was almost like we got a redo of opening day, right? With <laughs> Yeah. Let's see. It, it was a, a whole bunch of uh casual fans and uh pretty much everybody that considers themselves in the know showed up mm-hmm. to that to that as well and it was a weird mix of fans, I would say. But um yeah, everybody got to see what they wanted to see, right? Yeah, and uh uh, coming from two different perspectives here, I think, uh, I know you left a little bit after that rain delay started, uh, had some things to do on mother's day, happy mother's day, obviously to all the mothers out there, uh, make sure hopefully you said that to all of your moms yesterday. Um, I, uh, because I didn't have anything to do <laughs> stayed through that. And I will say I was pretty shocked at the amount of people that were still there through that entire thing. Now, do I think that there was a certain liquid that might may have given them the courage to just stay through the weather delay? Probably. Um, but it was a very fun time. And I think I had, uh, I actually will share a little bit of a story here that I thought was great. Jim Stam got to re- uh, run into him and meet him for the first time. Obviously, Gary's partner over at the Pirates Fan Forum. And he was asking me, he's like, how old are you again? To me. And I said, 25. And he's like, Ethan, we haven't seen anything like this in our lifetime speaking about Paul Skeens like this is something that even those who may have even seen the 79 World Series yeah that's obviously bigger than this there's never been a prospect debut this big in Pittsburgh I mean that considers Garrett Cole that considers Andrew McCutcheon that considers all of the big prospects that they've had throughout the years And you could just feel the energy in that place from even the moment that he went to the bullpen to go warm up. I mean, you knew he was warming up because there was about 150, probably 200 people all crowded around that bullpen trying to watch him. And I don't think I've ever seen a pitcher, Gary, get his warm up pitch cheered. I don't think I've ever (laughs) seen that before in my life. But aside from all that, um, it was a debut. I think. I think a lot of people expected him to go out there and pull a Steven Strasburg and have like 15 strikeouts and seven innings and all this other. I just didn't think that was ever really going to happen. Now, he obviously still had a phenomenal outing for a first major league start, I would think. You were obviously sitting more behind home plate, had a bit, little bit of a better view, uh, could see things more in terms of strikes and balls, even though you still can't really see everything up there. But you were even telling me, his demeanor was just there. Like he just looked like he belonged. He looked like a guy that was ready for this months ago, probably even a year ago and seven strikeouts over four innings. I don't look at the earned run number just because I think some of that's just not really his fault. I don't think they expected the bullpen to come out and throw 17 balls on 24 pitches, but he still gets credited with three earned runs. What were your general thoughts on the debut Gary though? Like overall, like how did you think that he did? in general he was pretty damn good and he didn't have his stuff (laughs) like he didn't have mostly any any of his stuff really um the fastball was there but i would say that uh guys were 
geared up for it and waiting for it. And the secondary stuff was good, but not quite as sharp as he typically has it. So, uh, you know, he was he was finding it a little bit, but he has enough in his arsenal that he can he can kind of pull into another lane if he wants to. He can go change up heavy and fool you just as bad as he can with that slider. And that's what he started doing, and, and he worked his way through those innings and mm-hmm. kept it kept it in check. I mean, yeah, it, it looks bad on the line, but, again, not really his doing. Then all that happened. I thought he. I thought it was a fine debut. I expect him to continue. I also think that he's a little bit of a victim of following Jared Jones because Jared Jones has been way more pristine than that. Yeah. So you know that's a lot to live up to right there. In fact, Mitch Keller is the only person that's laid a performance down that that makes you feel anything close to what you felt for Jared Jones this year. And he just did that last week. Yeah. And it's actually crazy because I know a lot of people probably want to forget the Friday game, but one could argue that Jared Jones start over the weekend was better than Paul Skeen's start was. You could probably argue that. And there's an argument, a short argument because he was. Yeah. And I mean, you were speaking about the fastball. The fastball is great. I obviously rewatched the game to see the perspective of it just from the TV and get all the ideas. And I think what was most impressive is a lot of people would look at, oh, well, he struck out the guys that he struck out in the first inning and looked dominant. What I thought was most impressive is how he was already working himself out of bad situations. I mean, he worked himself out of a bases loaded jam. Like you mentioned, he was using his secondary pitches a lot when he had to. And in part of that, him having to do that, that's why that pitch count got so high. And I did see some people, and you mentioned some of the casual fans, and I don't want to, like, trash on them, but they were like, he could have gone 100 pitches. Folks, the most pitches that he pitched before yesterday in his professional career so far was 75. So or, uh, so he hadn't went that far just yet. He could have gone 100 pitches. Like, but they don't they they could have allowed him to. I mean, I I do believe that the that's kind of his restraint right now. Mm-hmm. So they could have done it. I just didn't see a purpose in it. You know, I I, had, I think they had every intention of letting him go ahead and try to finish the fifth, but he left mm-hmm. the first two guys on. So yeah. you pull him out, you bring in Kyle Nicholas. Kyle Nicholas strikes out the first two guys, and then the rain comes and he loses everything. I mean, like, I don't know. I think it's just uh, one of those hindsight things where you look back and you're like, oh, but I didn't have a problem with the way they handled Paul Skeens at all. I didn't have a problem with getting him out of the game. I didn't have a problem with letting him try the fifth. I didn't have a problem with anything. And I do. And I do believe that on the broadcast yesterday, I was at work, so I don't know if they said this or not, but it does appear that he will be pitching Friday against the Chicago Cubs again. I think that was something that they said. I don't know if the team has announced that yet. But I saw somebody speaking on it that Skeens was going to start on Friday. And it's very interesting with the dynamic that the Pirates now have. And I think me, you, and Corey actually spoke about this, about the pitching that the Pirates have uh, during the rain delay. I mean, you're looking – Or Josh, Josh, yeah, not Corey. Um, Josh and Corey, you know, Bridge of October. Go check them out. I always get them mixed up. But, yeah, it was Josh. Um, But we were speaking on it, and this pitching staff right now – I mean, it's pretty good. I mean, there's a lot to like about this pitching staff and the things that they have going for themselves as far as the starting rotation is concerned. And it's going to get more fun as time goes. And Paul Skeens is going to be a part of that. And I think it's very fun that we got to see this debut. And really, truthfully, the way I felt is I don't know if I personally, even in my lifetime, will ever get to see a player of that magnitude debut as a prospect for the Pittsburgh Pirates again, just because of, I mean, all the tags that have put on, like have been put on skeins, generational this, he has the elite fastball and everything already. And one thing that I think is even more scary, Gary, and I want to hear your thoughts on this as well, is we know the fastball and the slider are there. If he could ever like truly make that change up, which it looked good already, but if he can make that uh, change up or the splitter or whatever they're calling it of an elite pitch and somehow add another one, if he wants to, I mean, that makes him even more scary than he already is. 
I mean, I kind of think they already are there. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I he wasn't as sharp as he's been. Like, I'll just no. say that in that in that first game. But you got to expect that a little bit. So I, I mean, I, I think we'll see him tighten it up a little bit. First of all, that's in his DNA. He's going to tighten things up every every outing until he gets where he wants to get. But I wouldn't worry about anything I saw. I don't think that anybody needs to like try to create some new pitch. He's already got about six or seven that he toys with. Yeah. Um, and I would say five of them are MLB passable pitches for sure. So I, I don't worry about this because I, he's a talent that I think is kind of beyond – is he going to be okay? Yeah, he's going to be okay. Yeah. You know? and, I've heard, and I've heard that too, is it's like a lot of people are saying, well, what if he doesn't work out? And I'm like, the there's one singular thing that is going to stop Paul Skeens in his career, and it's something that's stopping a lot of major league pitchers across baseball, and I won't say it because I won't speak it into the universe. It will probably happen at some point, but that's the only thing I think that's stopping Paul Skeens at any point in his career. He is that good, folks. And like we've sat on this show and said that after they drafted him, we've had multiple people tell us that. We've had analysts across baseball tell us that. That's no, they don't show, they don't throw that word around in baseball very often. They don't throw the word generational around all that often. And here it means a lot. And you could tell that in the stadium, it meant a lot to the fans. It meant a lot to the team. And really what I found even more fun about uh, whatever that game was on Saturday is the offense came alive for a little bit. Yeah. Don't don't know what happened there. uh, Even though I did joke before the game that it would be like a temporary outburst of offense, but really outside of Friday, the offense did not play all that bad in my opinion, throughout the weekend. So we'll get into a certain player that is kind of headlining that lately in O'Neill Cruz. But before we do that, folks, we're going to talk about Policy Genius. Folks, today's episode of Locked On Pirates is brought to you by Policy Genius. Check life insurance off your to-do list in no time and head to policygenius.com slash locked on MLB because Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace. And with Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same-day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius gives you unbiased advice from a licensed expert support team, and they have no incentive to recommend one insurer over another so you can trust their guidance. Thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot are just some of the things that you can find from customers who found the best fit for their needs. So check life insurance off your to-do list in no time. With Policy Genius, head to policygenius.com slash locked on MLB or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash locked on MLB. And folks, also don't forget to check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, the 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube and Amazon Fire TV. Obviously, we're getting some uh, news about the NFL schedule. Sure, the NFL host will be doing that. And, of course, you have the NHL and uh, NBA playoffs going on right now. And, of course, baseball. Find all that stuff on Locked On Sports today. So the offense on Saturday, since mainly the whole weekend was centered around that, decided to put up 10 runs uh, on Saturday. But a lot of that has been headlined, Gary, by something that we've kind of said on Steel City Pirates quite a bit something we've said on this show quite a bit, and something really honestly we've said on all of our shows quite a bit, is that when O'Neill Cruz is on, it kind of feels contagious around the offense when he starts get like getting it going. And I believe throughout that homestand, he had well over 1,000 OPS, eight RBIs, three home runs, three doubles. His exit velocities were those crazy stack cast numbers that we're so used to with O'Neill Cruz. Speaking of, before we started recording, uh, I was mentioning to Gary that O'Neill Cruz is second on average bat speed, which is a new thing that stack cast is tracking, only behind Giancarlo Stanton. Don't know what that really means for him, but it's a cool thing, I guess. And he's just starting to pick it up 
And it's something that I think we even talked about too, is that he didn't play baseball for a year. So now I think you're finally starting to see O'Neill Cruz kind of get his feet under him, get back to the guy that we're used to seeing a little bit, like even though he has had his struggles, you're starting to see him really pick it up and take those steps towards his maturity and towards his maturation of being a potential superstar. And I'm enjoying that because it seems like, too, that the offense is kind of following suit. You would like to see it a little bit more. But over the weekend, it did look like the offense at least had some life in itself throughout those three games. Yeah, I also think he's had a couple, I wouldn't say near miss injuries, but he's had a couple incidents where it kind of looked like, oh, uh uh-oh, did he hurt that ankle? Uh uh Uh-oh, did he hurt his side? Uh, You know, he's had a few of those moments now. And I think what we've seen is he's realized, yeah, that didn't feel great, but that thing didn't snap. I'm going to be all right. It's not going to hurt. You know, it's almost like when you play hockey and you have like a, an ankle injury and then you take a, a puck off of your ankle and then you realize like, okay, I can still skate. It didn't break. It's not made of glass. I'm going to be all right. You almost need to see that before you can really go and be yourself on, on the field. And I think we're starting to see that with him a little bit defensively. Honestly, he's been really clean lately. Like yeah. the the arm looks better. He's getting in better position to make throws. Um, still still has some issues getting to some balls. I would say, like as far as up the middle, like ranging mm-hmm. to his left, I think he struggles a little bit to get into position there. But I don't know if I could say any more so than most shortstops would, because that's kind of not the natural direction that they like to try to travel. Mm-hmm. Um, but but all in all, yeah, he's turning into everything we hoped he would be, and he's the engine that's going to drive this thing. So um, if he's going, everything else will look better. Yeah, and speaking on his defense a little bit too, obviously had that great play yesterday, making that diving catch in the middle infield. Even I know a lot of people were very frustrated after Skeens left that game Saturday, but being in person, that play he made, even though he couldn't make the throw just before the rain delay was a very tough play for him to make and arguably saved the game at that point. Because I mean, yeah, it was a tie game six to six, but it would have been seven to six Cubs going into the rain delay if he does not make that play arguably. And a lot of people say, well, he didn't try to make a throw. There was no throw to be made. It was a lot like a certain play that we saw on Sunday from Nico Horner at shortstop, where if that ball gets through, we're talking about the Pirates winning this series. And that was a game saving play by the Cubs last night or yesterday afternoon. And one of the components to all this is O'Neill Cruz playing. I think he needs to play every day that he's able to. I, I think most people would not argue with that whatsoever. And that's been an argument that we've kind of had a little bit lately about playing the right guys in this offense. After what I saw yesterday and really just what I've seen over the past week and change, Connor Joe needs to be in the lineup more often than not at this point. There's absolutely no reason that the guy who is leading your team in arguably the most important offensive category in OPS should only be in the lineup three days a week or four days a week. And well, that hasn't been the case all season. So. All season, but late, like this week, how many games did he start? I was trying to figure that out before he's, we recorded today. He's played in almost as many games as O'Neill Cruz. So like, okay. I think they're they're doing a lot of late inning swaps that I think are kind of confusing people into thinking that certain guys are playing a lot mm-hmm. and certain guys aren't. Like Jack Sawinski in the last 15 games only has 32 at bats. Which is now, nice. how do you expect Jack Sawinski to ever become anything with 32 no. at bats in 15 games, right? So that's a guy that if you're going to use him like that, send him down. Yeah. Get Arguably. him hot and then get him back up. Connor Joe, he's playing. Connor Joe, I think, has the fourth, third or fourth most at bats on the team right now, and he should. But you're right. They shouldn't be sitting him against righties, um, especially not for Rowdy Telez. If you're gonna if you're gonna still play Rowdy Telez, at least put Connor Joe in the outfield. He's better than you know Oliveris. Send him down. Do whatever you have to do 
to make yeah. sure Connor Joe's bat is in that lineup. DH yeah, him. because because it almost feels like too, and I know this is a it almost feels crazy to have this conversation, but when he's not in the lineup too, I mean, there's just dead. We've talked about this in years past about how you have dead spots in the lineup where it's just like you see three guys come up and it's almost like that inning feels like it's over already. And when Connor Joe isn't there, I mean, you still get them sometimes depending on the lineup that Shelton creates. But to me, who are the guys that you would think need to be in the lineup every single day? Like, I have been wanting to ask you that specifically because I feel like you'll give a better answer than I would. But I mean, right now, you know, you know, Brian Reynolds. Yeah. O'Neill Cruz, Connor Joe. Um, I would play Jack Swinski every day. I know it's counterintuitive looking at his average, but I don't think that they meet their projections this year without his power. Mm-hmm. And and if you don't try to get him going, I you know, the power's gonna have to come from somewhere and it certainly isn't coming from Rowdy. No. So I mean I'd play Jack Swinsky every day, whether whether they should or not is another thing. Gonzalez, because he just got called up here. I want to see him more often than not. Brian Hayes when he's healthy. I mean, they have five or six guys that should probably play most games. Yeah. One of them isn't Kutch anymore. No. And and that's the thing that I find interesting is when we start talking about Sawinski or Telez or whatever, it almost feels like Kutch gets the pass. And I'm like, Kutch hasn't been playing all that great either, folks. Let's just be honest about that. Yeah, I know he homered in Saturday's game and all these other things, and he's beloved in this city, but it's still okay to criticize him. He still has not played all that great. You could tell that the bat speed is not there as much anymore. He's not catching up to those fastballs that he was catching up to earlier in his career. That's just stuff that happens with age. I mean, there's nothing I think that Kutch can really do to stop that from happening. But we'll see what the offense can do uh, going into this week because this week continues what I call the most important stretch of the season so far against the Milwaukee Brewers and the Chicago Cubs again. But we're also going to talk about this bullpen a little bit, Gary, because things are starting to get very interesting with that group. But before we do that, folks, we're going to talk about prize picks. Today's episode of Locked On Pirates is brought to you by Prize Picks. Download the app today and use code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to $100 because all you have to do, folks, is pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch your winnings roll in with prize picks. Baseball is all the way underway. It's been underway for a minute, and it's in full swing. So don't miss your chance to add your favorite players, like Paul Skeens, from the Diamond in your prize picks entries. Whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, or first inning runs, take your pick of more or less and add them to your prize picks entries today. And don't forget... You can also get involved with the basketball postseason action as well and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks. So download the app today and use code Locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Over at prize picks, download the app today. And folks, welcome to the third and final segment of today's episode here on Monday, May 13th, 2024. Again, we're, we talked Paul Skies, we talked O'Neill Cruz, we talked the offense, recapping what was a crazy weekend. And one has to think that the bullpen being a little bit better, we might be talking about this in a lot different light outside of losing two out of three games. Um but really, all three games, the bullpen just did not look great at all. I, I don't think there's much argument there whatsoever. Obviously, I believe Jared Jones had another quality start on Friday. Uh, three earned over six, I believe is what he went. And then when he left, that game just gets out of hand, goes seven to two. You obviously saw what happened on Saturday, folks, with Skeens leaving the game. Pirates up six to one. All of a sudden, it's eight to six in the blink of an eye, unless you like we're there and we're in the rain delay. And then yesterday, um, Falter didn't have his greatest start, didn't have his best start, but still, I mean, the bullpen, I think did a lot better on Sunday than it did on Friday and Saturday. Chapman obviously gives up the Homer in uh, extra innings and they lose five to four. 
Did we overvalue this bullpen a little bit, Gary? Or do you think that injuries are kind of um, derailing it a little bit as well? I mean, it's not the bullpen that we envisioned. Like, that we're missing Baraki and Murata and, you know, several other players that I think we thought were going to factor into it a little bit. But there's still enough there. Um, you're going to have a... a a bad performance from somebody who's performed like Hunter Stratton's been great this year. Yeah. He has. So yeah, he let the game go against Jared Jones with, with Jared Jones, but eh, it's going to happen sometimes. It I mean, it just, it sucks. You know, like, do you want, do you immediately DFA the guy? No, he, no. he's, he's somebody that he's performed for you. He's done really well in the back end of that bullpen. I will say um, Chapman has been weird. Um, I don't even know what he's doing with with his fastball when he comes into games. It sometimes starts out at 92 and works its way up to 102, and I don't think that you have time to play games like that in MLB. So get yourself especially up especially in the- not as a reliever either. I mean, you're only going to be in there for one inning. So what are you trying to do for three outs? <laughs> yeah. So I understand changing speeds a little bit, but eh, you know, <laughs> throw, throw what you got brother. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, especially if it's not helping your control, if you're going to throw 94 or 95 because you want to get it over. Okay. Get it over that. You know, you can't miss and do that. So, mm-hmm. you know, Something needs to happen there. I'm sure he'll figure it out. His track record is long and illustrious. That said, the cliff comes for everybody, and you never know when it is. Bednar will be fine, although I don't I don't think he's an elite closer anymore. I no. already I don't. I think he's I think he's lost something deceptive on his fastball, and he couldn't afford it. He only threw 97 to begin with. It's not like he was that kind of guy that was just blowing guys away. He just couldn't tell where it was coming from. He had a really deceptive delivery. Something slight has changed. People can pick it up now. So he needs to change. He needs to turn into something else. This happens to closers all the time. That's why I didn't want to extend him. Will they be okay, though? Yeah, they'll be okay. They just can't do this six-man rotation thing for long. No. It, it's. It, I think it's going to go one time through, and then reinforcements will start to come up. We'll probably see Ryder Ryan come back. Majinski's probably going to be on the short list there. We'll start seeing some some talent work its way back up. Yeah, and it's a bullpen again, too, that I mean, even with the weekend that they had, you mentioned Hunter Stratton has been pretty good for what he's been, like what he's been asked to do. He's done exactly what he's been asked to do for the most part outside of just that one time on Friday. You look at Colin Holderman. I think he's quietly having one of the best seasons of a reliever in all of baseball right now. I mean, he's been that good since coming back off the injured list. And these are just things that a manager has to speak on, but also we we speak so, – what I find funny is when people speak so much about playing guys in the lineup every day, but then wanting to switch around all the roles in the bullpen all of a sudden. I'm like, you can't – I mean, these guys already have – their set roles like Bednar, no matter what, nine times out of 10, if they're winning a ball game in a safe situation and he hasn't pitched in the game yet, he's going to be the closer. That's just how it is. Chapman more often than not is going to be that guy you use in scenarios like you used yesterday, where it was a 10th inning of a game tie ball game. You're hoping he can just take it to the bottom of the 10th with only giving up maybe one earned run because of the ghost runner on second. Holderman's going to be that guy in the sixth or seventh inning that's going to lead it to those guys. And then you have the big group of Stratton and Nicholas and Ortiz that are going to supplement the bullpen when they need to. That's just how it's going to be, and those things aren't going to change. Like when Majinski and Ryder Ryan come back, they'll go right back into the same roles that they had beforehand. And that's just what I think with it. And eventually – This is a bullpen that, again, we talked about being a potentially top 10 unit in all of baseball. They have the guys. I mean, the the guys are there. The performance just has to be more consistent. And it, for the most part, has been. I just think, for me personally, it was a little more amplified because, one, I was in attendance, and, two, it's against a team I can't stand in the Chicago Cubs. And, and three, the weather really did play a role on on, on that. (laughs) 
on Saturday in particular. That that rain, ever since the sticky stuff um, was eliminated, every time it rains, the control goes south for almost yeah. everybody. And you saw even the Cubs pitchers were struggling with it as well. Like even mm-hmm. when we came back, the Cubs almost kind of pulled off the same exact thing and couldn't couldn't find the strike zone. So now their bullpen has been an issue most of the season. So maybe it's less unexpected for them. Yeah. But you're going to go through stretches like this. I, I'm not alarmed yet. I don't. I don't think this is a trend. I think the the scariest thing about the Pirates bullpen is that two of their worst pitchers are two guys that you expect to close games out, and that makes everything look worse. You know, um, I Holderman. You talked about sixth, seventh. I I think Holderman should be more eighth, ninth. So do I. So I agree. We'll see how they end up getting to where they're getting. But if you think like that, they're just going to turn a blind eye to whatever is happening with David Bednar because he's the Yenzer, you might be assuming that some of the people running the Pirates are more Yenzer than you than they are. <laughs> they they care about that that stuff, but it's not going to stop them from making changes. So. No. <laughs> And, of course, you hope that the bullpen can be at its best going into the series against Milwaukee Brewers, a team that they already split with. This will be the first time they go and play in Milwaukee. Uh, Don't know. Did we already get the uh, pitching assignments for this one, or did they not release it yet? I think Keller is Yeah, it's in the series preview uh, that I wrote today. Um, Yeah, so it should be Keller and Colin Rea, Quinn Priester, and uh, Joe Ross, and then, of course, Martin Perez and Gasser going in that one. This is an interesting series, again, because um, to quickly preview it, I mean, the Pirates split with this team already this year, played against them pretty well, played a pretty good game overall. And, I mean, going into this series, I think really what you're hoping is from those three pitchers and Keller, Priester, and Perez is that you get what you've been getting from your starters. And if the offense can come along, which it seems like, it's slowly and surely making its way back to that point because that's one thing I had to tell a lot of people over the weekend is this offense is not going to be this bad forever. It is like mathematically very impossible for it to be that bad this long, but it's a series that's very winnable for the pirates. And I think it's a series that's very losable for the pirates, depending on what offense you're getting and what pitching you get. I know those are both very like just, like it's it's funny, Ethan, because we 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 try to analyze everything, and and we will. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, they're a five hundred team. Yeah. It's what I thought they would be. It's what I think they're going to be. I think it's what we're seeing them be. And in a five hundred team, you're going to go into every series thinking you could win it. Yeah, but you could lose it too. Like even this series against Milwaukee, this isn't Milwaukee's three best pitchers. No. Sadly, it's not our three best either. So you're going you're going to be leaning on offense and geez, which one of the teams do you take if you're trying to trust offense, right? I mean, I would go with Milwaukee. That said, they play in Milwaukee. There's a reason their offense looks better on paper. So and when they're on the road, they don't perform like that. So I think there there is a little bit to be said for Let's just let it play out a little bit, but Mm -hmm. I don't know. And and also going into this series too, as I'll speak with everybody, I've said this on the show in the past, this series scares me for two reasons. Uh, One, it's the Brewers, and two, it's in Milwaukee, as I like to call it, the House of Horrors. I've called it the House of Horrors ever since I started the show. For some reason, the Pirates just hate playing there, (laughs) and I don't know why, but It'll be a fun week, I think. It'll be a big week. And Gary, look at it this way. For everybody that was bringing up the uh, the last year stretch, they're already better than last year. They already won a game, folks. They're already on the trend up from last year's stretch of nine games that they lost in a row. So it can't get any worse. I mean, it could right now, but it, it they've already improved from last season. So look at it that way, folks. Folks, thank you for tuning in. To the Locked On Pirates podcast here on the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team, your Pittsburgh Pirates, every single day. I promise we will not be talking about Paul Skeens again until Friday. 
I know this is like the fifth consecutive episode where the episode was headlined by Paul Skeens. But that's what happens when a generational prospect comes up. You can find this show, obviously, on YouTube. Hit that subscribe and like button and the notification bell to be notified, I guess, whenever you get this show every Monday through Friday. It's on all your audio platforms as well, free and available to you. Gary, who do you have on the forum this week? Uh, just me and Jim this week. We're going to take a break from having guests and see if we can't figure out what's going on with this here Bucko team. Yep, and you guys will also see my series preview for the Cubs series later in the week over at Steel City Pirates. Please find all of the writing work over there at Steel City Pirates. It's a great website, great informative website to find everything you need in writing form in case you don't want to listen to a 35-minute show, which is understandable every once in a while. But, folks, thank you so much for tuning in. Have a wonderful rest of your Monday. My name's Ethan. That's Gary. We'll see you on the flip side.